First of all, how many of you have managed to get to see a presidential candidate or president uh, in person at, a, at an event? Quite a few, almost everybody. So, um, one thing that that came about this year uh, with the presidential campaigns this year was that Buffalo County has some connections to presidential candidates in 2012. Uh, one, of course, is Newt Gingrich, who was uh, married to remember her name, Calista, yes. who is from the Whitehall area, but. Newt is actually listed in our 2003 biographical history book as in someone's biography in there. So uh, it's kind of interesting to have that little connection to Buffalo County, even though it's very remote. Uh, then the other person, of course, was Michelle uh, that ran or was was a candidate for the GOP presidential con or candidacy. Um, and of course, her husband grew up here in the town of Montana in Buffalo County. And they were actually married on the family farm in Montana. So. Um, in fact, I think I told Gary and Chris not too long ago that uh, we were doing some research just maybe a month or two ago and came across some paperwork that actually listed at the bottom of it that this, these copies were made by, and it was actually made by, uh, by Michelle. So uh, it's kind of a surprise that you have. We have that kind of connection here in our county. So. You worked in a courthouse here for a while. Okay, and that's where she, that's, well, that's how she got her start. All right, well today we're going to talk about three famous visitors to Buffalo County. And uh, famous visitors, not that kind of visitors, but these visitors here. So first of all, in 1952, um, Robert Taft, he was the son of William Taft, uh, decided to run for president as a Republican. Uh, at the time, uh, he was actually, when he came to Buffalo County, he was kind of the forerunner in the, in the campaign at the time. Uh, his opponents included Dwight D. Eisenhower, who of course actually ended up going on to become president then. Uh, Harold Stassen, who was the former governor of Minnesota. And then Earl Warren, who was the governor of California. Um, as I mentioned, Robert Taft was actually the favorite coming into Wisconsin. Uh, but the reason for that was because Dwight Eisenhower wasn't even on the ballot. Uh, many of the states, Eisenhower wasn't on the ballot at all because he really didn't want to run at first. But as support came along, he eventually got, got, into, the, got into the swing of things and, and decided he would, would continue on. So, the first GOP primary was March 11th, so I thought this was kind of interesting because I thought that we started the primaries really early this time. <laughs> and looking back, I realized that it's not really as early as I thought it was, because 60 years ago they started in March. And Wisconsin's uh, primary, which is actually called the presidential preference vote, uh, was actually April 1st already. So uh, we aren't any earlier now than we were then when you look at, at history. Um, Robert Taft came to Wisconsin on March 17th, so after the New Hampshire primary was over with, he came to Wisconsin. And there's a picture of him actually in Madison. Um, he flew in on the 17th to Madison, and then stayed overnight. And on the 18th, he spoke with, or spoke at Nielsville, Osseo, and then Mondovi. So I should say on the 17th, he actually spoke in Madison as well. That's right. You know, I do not know. It might be though. Yeah, this was a this would have been a picture from the State Historical Society's collections. So. so just to give you an idea of what the what the atmosphere was like um, when he came to Wisconsin, I have this little video for you. So. in New Hampshire for delegates to the Democratic and Republican National Conventions find candidates and campaign managers pulling no punches. Everyone is in there pitching in an endeavor to gauge the mood of the American people. This is the first real popularity test for the favorites, and Senator Robert 
Baytap comes to New Hampshire to make his bid. Lee Stassen hopes for another opportunity to corral the Republican nomination. The citizens of the Granite State are not easily won. The country meeting places are hotbeds of political discussion. In village, town, and city, voters brave bitter snow and sleet to cast their votes. Stassen, Warren, MacArthur, Truman, Kefauver. It's a free country, and no armed guards to restrict your personal opinion. It was the nation's first presidential primary, and a record one. And when the ballots were totted up, it was a clean sweep for General Eisenhower on the Republican side, and for Senator Estes Kefauver heading the Democratic slate. Hampshire has spoken, and experts are looking for more straws in the political wind. All right, as you heard there, um, Eisenhower did win in New Hampshire. Uh, he was on the ballot there, but again, like I said, he was not on the ballot in Wisconsin, so that's why he didn't do it. He actually got zero votes, period, in Wisconsin. Um, at least as far as I can tell, it doesn't say if he was ever a write-in. There were very few writing votes, so I can't imagine he had very many at all. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting with that video is it talks about the fact that there were no armed guards at the polling places, um, <laughs> which didn't really click to me until I realized this was only a few years after World War II was over with. And so, of course, you know, communism was a big deal. This is the early 50s. And uh, you know, the freedom of, of anything, any kind of freedom, was a, a pretty big deal at that point, because we had just avoided losing losing that for you, so. um, On March 18th, he spoke in Mondovi, which we'll get back to. But Taft, on March 19th, went on to speak at UW-Stout in Menominee, as well as the Barron County Electric Cooperative. About two weeks before Taft came, Mondovi declared March 18th Bob Taft Day. Uh, they planned a parade and a dinner uh, as well as uh, he was going to have some time to speak to, to the community and, and that. So, of, uh, when looking at the Journal Sentinel, well, actually not the Journal Sentinel, at the time it was the Milwaukee Journal, when looking at the journal papers from that, those days, uh, Taft met with about 5,000 people on the 18th. 2,500 of those were in Mondovi, so it shows you how big of a poll uh, declaring Taft Day became. And just to give you an idea here, in a little bit, you'll see that was the weather that day. Uh, you know, it's, it's March, <laughs> so just like it is today, even though it's, it's May. <laughs> this actually involved a little bit of snow and sleet as well. So uh, if you can imagine how much fun it was to be a, in the parade that day. Uh, I wish Jan Schoen could have been here today. She's talked to me a few times about this. She was a freshman in high school, so she was actually in the marching band for Alma that year. And she had to march in this parade, and she said that was the worst parade she ever had to deal with. Because it was just cold. My sister said the same thing. She said it was impossible to get his home from speaking, oh, yeah. from everything except playing music. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, for those of you that have played instruments in the cold, you have an idea of what this is like. There were seven county high school bands in the parade. And one of my favorites, and there's a, there a picture of these two in the Winona paper, um, but to get it, it was, it's a very bad picture, so. But W.G. Cashmore and Jack Sessions were both 77 years old and had voted for William Taft in his presidential election in 1908. And uh, Robert actually met with them before, he had his, before the parade started, and they told him that he had their vote this time, too, so. <laughs> they said they were going to they were going to keep voting for the family as long as they could. So. Okay, and I think this is the best float of the whole or part of the whole parade. William Meyer of Gilmanton and his son Marvin had a donkey in the parade, and <laughs> William's board on his on his chest says Gilmanton's only Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> After the parade, 
uh, Taft went on to give a speech. Uh, his speech, according to the papers, was really directed towards farmers. Uh, when you look through the other, you know, of course, like most good politicians, every place he went, he directed it towards his, his audience. Yeah, so in Mondovi, he directed it really towards farming. Um, he crowned kings and queens from five towns within the, within the county. Um, I've actually found the names of these people, but as far as I can tell, I don't think any of them are still around. Uh, but they would have only been, I think they were all seniors in high school at the time, if I remember, according to the, the newspaper. So. Uh, and then Mondovi Mayor K.J. Jacobson uh, presented him with the key to the city. Uh, I've done a little looking, I don't know if, I don't know whatever happened to this stuff, like the key to the city, if, it, if it's in his paper somewhere or, or what, but it would be kind of interesting to see what happens. Then I'd like to also find out what it opens, but probably not. Really. So, as I said, he came the 18th. The election was 1952, uh, in 1952 was on April 1st. And here I gave kind of a breakdown on the people that were on the ballot and how they, how they did. Uh, Taft won, uh, he had probably about 40% of the vote in Buffalo County, but the rest of it was split up between Warren and Stassen. And in the 9th Congressional District, we were in the 9th Congressional District at that time, not the 3rd that we are now. Uh, he did win that just barely over Warren. And in Wisconsin overall, he did, he did win Wisconsin as a, as a whole. Again, all of those were only with about 40% of the vote, but, but he was definitely the, the winner as far as Wisconsin went. Uh, just to give you some more flavor of what it was like then, uh, after Taft lost and Eisenhower went on to be the candidate, this was in a camp, one of the first campaign ads. This was actually the 1952 campaign was the first year that campaign ads like we think of them were actually run on TV. So this was an advertisement by Steve, Adlai Stevenson, who was the Democratic candidate of that year. And hopefully it'll work. Hi. Everything. Let's never separate again, Bob. Never again, I. Bob. <laughs> Bob. Bob. No, I can Bob really live happily ever after. Is the White House big enough for both of them? Stay tuned for a little bit. Roman, Roman, I've been thinking, Bob and I now think of life. So it's a little different than what we see today, isn't it? Oh, much better than what we have now. It is better than what we have. But that just kind of gives you an idea of what, what, the, what the, the national outlook was as far as that, that uh, election. I didn't even listen to that. The first negative ad. Yeah, it was. It was pretty much the first negative ad. Uh, yep. So, uh, then of course, the next time we had a presidential campaign come through Buffalo County was in 1960. And this one, I actually have had very few people tell me they remember hearing about this. Uh, but of course, this wasn't as big of a day as, as Bob Taft's was. Uh, JFK came to Mondovi in 1960 uh, to do it was just a short visit uh, at the Commercial Hotel. Uh, but just to give you a quick rundown, these were his opponents in 1960, and there's a lot of them. So. Uh, first was Lyndon B. Johnson, who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time. Uh, Stuart Sivington was a, a senator from Missouri. Hubert Humphrey, of course, from Minnesota. Paul Fisher, a businessman from Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the, uh, I'm forgetting what it's called. He, this guy is the guy that invented the pen that could write upside down. Um, it was actually called the Fisher Aerospace Pen or something like that. So. He was the inventor of that. <coughs> Robert Miner, the governor from New Jersey. Wayne Morse, the senator from Oregon. Uh, George Smathers from 
Florida, Senator again, and Ed Lai Stevens, who we just saw an ad for from eight years earlier, uh, he ran again in, from Illinois. So JFK came to Wisconsin uh, for actually this was his second trip to Wisconsin. He came uh, in January, around the 20th of January. And he came back in February of 1960. And one of the interesting parts about his trip to Wisconsin is that uh, he was told by all of his advisors not to come to Wisconsin, uh, mainly because you had Hubert Humphrey next door. So everybody said, well, there's no way he could ever win the state if you've got you know, the senator that everybody loves in Minnesota right next door. Um, Patrick Lucy, who was the Wisconsin Democratic chair at the time, uh, there's actually a, an interview with him that you can take a look at online. Uh, and he talks about the fact that Patrick and JFK's father were the only two people that advised him to come to Wisconsin anyway. And JFK said he was going to try because he thought, you know, I need to get to every state if I can. So, and we'll actually see a little bit more about that okay, if I go back now. See a little bit more about that right here. This was a conference he had in 19, uh, January 21st, the first time he came to Wisconsin. I'm fully aware of the risks and difficulties that course involves. No other candidate, real or unannounced, has indicated a willingness to enter any primary adjoining the home state of another contender, including New Hampshire is next to my own state of Massachusetts. The, the historic presidential primary laws of this state, the first state to provide for the direct, direct election of delegates, going back all the way to 1905, was not designed by Bob LaFollette to be used by local or regional favorite sons as a means of obtaining bargaining power for national convention maneuvering. They were intended to give the voters an opportunity to contribute this state's convention votes to a winning majority for the one candidate whom they both wish and expect to see nominated and elected as President of the United States. The Republicans of Wisconsin have frequently in the past been given a wide choice of presidential contenders. In 1960, they will not have such a choice. The Democrats must. If the Democratic Party were to abandon the course adopted by Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt of building a presidential campaign on the public support and confidence expressed in the primaries, we would lose our claim to that support and confidence in the November election. Well, there's several polls. The poll that uh, I saw yesterday that uh, was taken last fall by a magazine here. All right, you can kind of see what he was talking about there. Uh, nobody was going to campaign in anyone's neighboring states. Um, you know, if you think about it, if, if people did that today, it would be a lot nicer for a lot of us. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was, that was kind of what people had thought they thought they should do. Uh, I imagine this was their way of protecting people from having to have their their own state or their statehood try and decide and do we really want to try and support someone else or can we try and support our home our home boy? So um, he goes on to answer some more questions there and that really didn't make much sense to keep that part, but uh, again I mentioned he came the second time on the twenty fourth of February. He came to Madison. Uh, he went on to visit Columbus that day, uh, Portage, and then came back to Madison for his last stop of the night where he actually had to talk three times to Madison that day, once in the morning and then two more times at night. Um, on the 25th, he visited Wausau, so he flew up to the northern part of the state now, Antigo, Merrill, uh, Medford, the Abbot, or Taylor, and then Abbotsford. So this is a lot. It's a lot of moving around. Um, then on the 26th, which is the day that he came to Buffalo County, he went to Eau Claire, uh, Chippewa Falls, uh, Bloomer, Menominee, and Durand before 
and he also ended up in Mondovi still. Uh, Mondovi wasn't his last stop of the day, but uh, he met with Democrats and, as the paper said, met with, he was going to meet with Democrats and interested voters at 2.45 at the Commercial Hotel. Uh, I was just talking with Steve earlier and we were mentioning that the Mondovi paper did a horrible job of covering this event. So they, they had a little blurb saying, you know, presidential candidate John F. Kennedy will be coming to Mondovi at 2.45 at the Commercial Hotel and anyone interested can come. But then there was nothing else. There was no coverage after the fact or, or anything else. Uh, there wasn't even any mention after he won the election that he had been there earlier in the year. So. Uh, There's a picture there of Russ Corbett. I don't know if any of you know. There's Russ Corbett who's meeting JFK at the Commercial Hotel in Mondovi. So. I thought that was a neat picture. And again, here are the presidential preference results. Um, as you can see, Kennedy lost to Humphrey in Buffalo County, uh, which it you know, makes sense. I mean, here again, Humphrey's right across the river. Um, and Humphrey was able to win the 9th Congressional District as well, which again was mostly in this part of the state. But in Wisconsin, Kennedy pretty much walked away with it. Uh, just kind of goes to show how, how uh, ambitious he was, as you can see just by his travel schedule for those three days, uh, and how well liked he, he became uh, by people. Here's a little advertisement from the Kennedy campaign I thought you guys might like. This I think would probably have resonated most with people in our area, being a more rural, uh, rural area. Kennedy's visit. Um, as you can see, it was a very short visit for Buffalo County, but again, uh, it, was a, it was a good visit. I think it's kind of funny because the shorter visit he had, he actually is the man that won the election of the three people that came, the three presidential candidates that came to Buffalo County. That's the only one where he won, so I think that's probably why presidential candidates stay away from Buffalo County. Uh, <laughs> the, other, the other two didn't do so hot. So, um, Well, that's Carter was already president. Oh well, yeah, I know Carter. He had one end up lost, right? Yeah, we'll get we'll get into that a little more here. But um, a lot of you guys will remember 1979 when Jimmy Carter came. Um, I know there's quite a few people here that probably were there. I was there, so and I kind of remember it. But um, Carter's trip was on the Delta Queen, and it was actually considered a vacation for his family. Um, but the people that owned the Delta Queen talked about actually allowing him to stop anywhere he wanted to stop along the way. If he wanted to do any kind of you know, tour of town or whatever he wanted to do, they were willing to do it. But in Carter's memoirs and stuff, he talks about how he did not want to do that because other people were on the ship too. It wasn't just him. You know, obviously, uh, I mean, Chris, like, Chris and Linda like to go on a cruise ship. Could you imagine if they decided, well, we're going to just stop wherever Chris and Linda want to stop? <laughs> The other couple thousand people might not like that after a little bit, so. Um, so I can understand his, his concerns with that. Um, he later on talked about it. They, actually, he was interviewed at uh, Minnesota City by some, some uh, 
press people that were along the, the river. The boat, well, he was still on the boat. He, they were just kind of going along. And uh, they asked him if it, was a, if it was a campaign stop, and he said, if it's a campaign at all, it's a campaign for a stronger country and a comprehensive energy policy. That was what his, his thing was at the time. Um, I don't know if many of you remember this, uh, this specific way, but this was only a couple months after his, what, what people called the Malay speech. So, um, you know, the country hadn't been doing the greatest, and he was trying to turn it around, which was understandable still. Uh, Delta Queen left St. Paul on August 17th and arrived in Elma on the 18th the next morning. And this is actually, it's kind of hard for you guys probably to see, but uh, it's a presidential diary for the day. And it actually goes right down the list and says that 11.20 a.m., or, yeah, 11.20 a.m., the President, the First Lady, and Amy Carter greeted the crowd gathered for their visit. Um, they went back on Delta Queen. The, this was in Wabasha, they were actually Wabasha. 12.34, the Delta Queen departed Wabasha. 1.34, it arrived at Lock and Dam, number four in Alma. Uh, the President addressed the crowd gathered for his arrival. Then the President went ashore to greet the crowd gathered for his visit. So a lot of you probably remember that. I think he, he didn't go over the fence. I think he stayed on, did he stay on the other side of the fence? And uh, then it goes on to tell that, that he was telephoned by a guy and he didn't answer the phone. I think that's kind of funny that's in there, but... Uh, and then the president returned to the Delta Queen and then they departed Lock 4 and went down their way. Um, so the citizens of Elma presented a few gifts to the Carters when they came, and you guys may remember some of this, but uh, John Runyon's, for instance, donated a copy of his, uh, his painting of the Delta Queen. And that was given to the Carters. Um, on the back of it was a piece of paper that listed uh, a bunch of prominent, you know, like stuff from the mayor and other, other things like that. Virgie, were you the mayor at that time? Uh, right? Did you get to go on the boat and visit them? No. Well, that's not very good. I, I think uh, Patty Schultz. Patty Schultz? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was, um, Mrs. Carter was given a dozen red roses. It was her birthday that day, so, and the, the entire crowd sang happy birthday. Um, right. And then Amy Carter was given a rod and reel. Of course, in Alma, what would you give some, what would you give a little girl? <laughs> a rod and reel and an Alma t-shirt. I'm thinking I remember these Alma t-shirts. They weren't that great, so, but. Here's some pictures, actually, uh, Steve had sent me some pictures, um, and you can see Jimmy here, kind of giving people, you know, trying to shake people's hands over the fence. And then uh, Amy, you can see Amy uh, with a little bonnet and the picture on the right. Uh, I keep forgetting that she was that little when she came, you know, I, I thought she was, well, she's older than I was, so I, I'm sure I thought she was some old woman, so, time. When you're five, you think those things. And then here's a picture of him when he was doing his speech from the ship. Um, in fact, I'm gonna, just to give you an idea, they actually have the text from his speech online uh, at the Jimmy Carter's, uh, well, I should have Jimmy Carter's uh, presidential library. They have it there too, but it's also at a place called the American Presidency Project. And it was a pretty short speech, so I thought I'd, I'd just read what it was, and this might ring a bell to some people. So, uh, his comments were, I hope that you all remember what a great country we have, how strong we are, and how much God has blessed us. We have a serious problem, as you know, right now with inflation that's been with us for 10 or 12 years, and with too much dependence on foreign oil, which makes our nation's security a cause of great concern. There's only two things we can do about it. One is to save energy, conservation, to stop wasting so much energy. And every single person in our nation can help with that. Figure out in your own driving habits, the way you heat your home, the way you air condition your home, the way you share automobiles, everything that you do, and try to save as much energy as possible. And secondly, we need to increase the amount of energy that we produce in our own country. Solar energy, increased use of coal, synthetic fuels, and the other kinds of things that we can do in the great nation. We have now before the Congress proposals which will give us an opportunity both to save and to produce more in our own country. It must be financed by the windfall profits tax, a tax on the oil companies, so that they won't make the tremendous profits and keep it for themselves. But share it through your government with you so that we can weatherize homes 
give us better transit systems, and so forth. I hope that you will contact your own members of Congress and ask them to support the windfall profits tax because out of that tax can come enough money from the oil companies to help poor people, those with low incomes or moderate incomes, to pay for the increased cost of energy, to provide cons conservation encouragement, and also to produce more fuel for ourselves in our own country. We've got about 25% of the total energy reserves on Earth in our own national, our own nation. All the OPEC countries put together only have less than 5%. But we need to use our energy more effectively. So if you'll help me, I'll help you, and we'll make the greatest nation on Earth even greater in the future. Will you help me? Then there was followed by applause, and he said, good. So that was kind of his, his speech. And again, like I mentioned before, he's really trying to tell his energy policy along this trip. And that's a good example there of, of how he was trying to tell it. There is one other thing I need to share with you guys, and this is actually an article from uh, 2009, and it was actually in the, uh, the Telegraph, which is a newspaper in the, the United Kingdom. Uh, a man from there, his name was Toby Harnett. He actually wrote an article about some friends he knew, and uh, Toby. Toby and some of his co-workers have done some work along the Mississippi River for the, the Telegraph. Uh, so this is his story. He says, uh, history has not hitherto recorded it, but when President Jimmy Carter took a trip down the Mississippi on the Delta Queen in August 1979, he was given an unusual greeting when the vessel passed from Illinois, Minnesota and route from St. Paul to St. Louis, Missouri. One of the workers in the Bay State Milling Company, who requested anim anonymity in case the Secret Service might still be interested in pursuing the culprits, three decades on, recounted what happened. On the seventh floor, there's a little walkway out the door, a boat full of people, they're all singing along with the calliope. We decided to move President Carter in the boat. Who the hell could ever get away with that anymore? You could see people pointing up, and pretty soon everybody's looking. You could see them just laughing. The president was there on the top deck looking up with everybody else. Then all of a sudden a helicopter comes around and there was a the sound of a loud hailer saying, please return him to the building. It was kind of funny, just a harmless joke. We figured those fellows would come in and try and find us, so we changed our clothes, but no one tried to discover who did it. <laughs> that just goes to show you how these visits could turn out. <laughs> All right, obviously, you know, as I, we talked before, Jimmy was not on a, on a, a campaign, re-election uh, re campaign at the time. Uh, and as, as time went on, you know, things got progressively worse for him, and he eventually ended up not winning. But uh, this was something I just thought was kind of interesting. This is a, another one of his uh, campaign ads that I think kind of, fits with what Jimmy Carter has always stood for, so I'm gonna play this one for you guys. I'm grateful that I can look back on my first term and see four <coughs> years of peace. And that's what we want for the next four years, is peace. But I'd like to remind you that the peace we enjoy is based on American military strength and American moral strength. As the first president from the Deep South in 140 years, President Carter personifies and carries to the nation and to the world a special view of the ancient relationship between making war and preserving the peace. We Southerners believe in the nobility of courage on the battlefield, and because we understand the cost of war, we also believe in the nobility of peace. President Carter military man and a man of peace. Well again as you can see it's, it's even better. They, they get even better with their ads as they go. So um, then to just add, add a kind of an ending to the Carter visit, um, here were his election results in 1980. In, in Buffalo County he actually almost pulled off Buffalo County. Uh, it was pretty close. Um, in Wisconsin, he lost by about 100,000 votes, and overall in the U.S., he lost by about 8 million votes, which was, was quite a chunk, so uh, almost 8% of the vote. So that, that just gives you a quick idea of, of that. Um, I guess the next thing I wanted to ask you guys is, 
how many of you guys want to share any kind of stories or things you remember about these trips? Um, I know that all of you have been, or most of you have at least been in some way associated with them. I know even Dorothy told me about Palmer. I think Palmer was uh, on the JFK trip. He, he uh, went from Adobe to the next school he went to. Okay. And uh, the FBI was leading him, and he was supposed to, or he was uh, leading them there, and they were right on his bumper, and he kept going faster and faster, and he was going 90 miles an hour. So, you know, they just wanted to go fast. Yeah. And I, w I went along, but I was sick, so I didn't want to give the president sick, so I didn't get out of the So I didn't get to take the pan. Right. But it was, we felt, you know, presidential candidate, no matter what party is here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you realize how how rare it is for, especially our area, to get you know, a visit from a candidate. So, anyone else? Virgie, do you remember much about the, uh, the car? Uh, I remember being there. Uh, I remember uh, some, some uh, young lady, and I, I think it was from the show, that uh, gave the Yeah, I didn't know if I didn't know if John Runyon's got to go on the boat or if he just was able to give it to him, you know, on the shore or whatever. But, um, yeah, and I would ask if anybody remembers the Taft thing, but I also don't want to make anybody feel because it's you know, it's been 60 years, so you know, <laughs> I don't want to make anybody admit to it. But, um, when Carter came to Elm, he was going to stop in. And somebody said, they sure as hell are, there's going to be a yeah. big crash. <laughs> <laughs> they, they weren't going to stop, but, but they had to stop because of the water. Yeah. Yeah, I know that his, um, in the, what I had read, um, they actually, the only reason they stopped in lava show is because they had to take on the water. Because there was so much hullabaloo in St. Paul that they couldn't fill their water tanks there. So they had to fill it in Wabasha, and it took them about two hours to fill the tanks. So that's what, that's why he went to shore in Wabasha at the time. But it sounds like there were quite a few times along the trip where he, uh, they'd be close to shore, and there'd be people, you know, and they'd come out and wave to people and stuff, and that kind of thing. But There's a contrast in security to some of the stuff in O'Clair now when they had candidates, you have to go so, two, three hours early and just stand and wait. Yeah. Where the Carter ones, he just kind of showed up. Or, yeah. You know, there are secret service around, and nobody knows metal detectors or, yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Do you have something? Well, uh, you mentioned security, and I know they said that, <coughs> you know, with the bumps in the streets and so forth up here, where it's kind of late there, just to cover all that. To cover it, yeah. And I was standing on the <coughs> far end of the bridge over the tracks there. I was uh, changing my telephoto lens on my camera, and the fellow with those little earphones came over and stood right next to me to see what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, my dad was telling us a story the other night that he was, he said as he was standing, you know, by the box of dam, by the, by the dam there, and um, a friend of his was, or another guy was standing next to him with his hands in his uh, overalls, like most guys did, and uh, he said some guy walks up behind him and says, sir, Please pull your hands slowly out of your out of your clothing. Yeah. yeah, you know, and we wouldn't have thought anything of it, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I know it's a lot different today. I know I've, I managed to get to see um, during President Bush's re-election campaign. I saw him, and I I always got a kick out of just you know you'd see all these security guys on every rooftop around. And, you know, before the buses come, there's a helicopter checking everything out. Of course, they have like three buses because they want to make sure that nobody knows which bus the candidate's on anymore. And it's, it's just insane if you want to secure your buses. Anyone else have anything else to add? Or stories you've heard? Well, one thing I've always heard was uh, that Chris Lander was chief of police when Carter was here. Okay. 
and uh, uh, Fritz apparently was uh, down there when he did come off of the boat onto the, uh, the edge there, and they had a, a, a just a wide plank for him to walk on. And of course, he was looking around and, and, and everybody, and he misstepped and he was starting to fall into the river, and Fritz caught him. <laughs> okay. And, Saved the day that day. <laughs> <laughs>